Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast presented by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Be sure and check them out at BlueWaterClimateControl.com. Been talking about uh, their January special that they've got going on, and they're selling these things and moving these things like crazy. That's those ductless single zone mini splits, which again, is great for a sunroom, bonus room, uh, a shop, your garage, whatever the case may be. Um, it's a great little unit that can heat and cool a room that seems to be always uncomfortable. Uh, it's a great little system. I've talked about it. My mom's got one uh, in her son room. My sister has one in her bonus room as well. So these things are great little units. Give them a call today and find out more about them at 86. You can call them at 865-299-2290. Visit them online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. Remember, you can always book your appointment online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. They've got their winter maintenance program going on right now with their uh, heater tune-ups going to get cold this weekend so anything you need you can check them out at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com with austin price and rob lewis i'm brent hubs as the waiting game continues for the tennessee football team and uh, the waiting game continues for jeremy pruitt as to what's going to go on there the first question right now remains uh, our center front and center to me is can they get something done uh, with kevin Steele, who they're trying to work out an agreement with uh, austin We'll see if they can get the language right in the contract to get that right. And, and Rob, jump in here as well. Everyone wants to know, what does it mean if they get that deal done? It, it means that Kevin Steele would be on Tennessee's campus in some role as a defensive coach, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I think would be, a, you know, a great addition to the staff. You know, I mean, he's a veteran coach. I think he recruits really well. Kids love to play for him. He's always been a player's coach. And you stop along the way, whether it be as an assistant at Alabama, assistant at Auburn, uh, you know, Clemson. You can go right down the list. This guy has coached for a lot of uh, big-time coaches and, and has just been around really good programs. So, you know, if they can get this done, and again, right now it's a matter of just figuring out how to get the language right with, you know, obviously him being paid by Auburn for most of it and then Tennessee being able to bring him on as a defensive assistant, then I think that it, it's a huge addition to the staff. It's going to make Tennessee's, Tennessee fans' heads explode, though, trying to figure out what it means. I mean, the signals that it's sending with, you know, Jeremy for it, you know, can he make hires? Can he not make hires? What's going on with the investigation? And then you bring in a high profile guy like Kevin Steele to join your staff. I mean, I tried, tried to decipher all of that is, is mind boggling. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have an answer to that in terms of what it means, you know, for, for sure. I mean, I, and, and I know that sounds a little hypocritical because I think that I said on a podcast a week and a half, two weeks ago, you know, that if Jeremy Pruitt made a hire, that would be a pretty good indicator on where things are. But I don't know that, that it's a lock stock anything at this point in time. But the fact of the matter is Jeremy Pruitt's being allowed and is working to try to hire somebody and, and, and is – you know, they're working through a contract. And, and that's the question we all had. Would they, would they write a contract up for somebody else? And they are for, for, for Kevin Steele. And that's the, that's the answer that we know at this point. Uh, we do also know, Austin, that the investigation is ongoing and continuing. Hopeful that it would be wrapped up at the end of this week. I don't know if it will be. Um, and so there's still the uncertainty out there with that. But, but obviously, there's a being allowed to move forward with some things in the football program is the best way I know to say it right now. Yeah, correct. I mean, you know, um, I think that, you know, the, the investigation, I think the last day for interviews is Thursday um, with multiple interviews set up for that day, which would include coach Pruitt. Um, you know, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the best way to look at it is the way you just said, I mean, you know, there is some progress of, as far as, forward movement but at the same time until this thing wraps up there's still going to be doubt out there you know because I mean you've got a portion of people like there's no way he's back then there's a portion of the people that are oh he's back you know and so like you know you got two sides just like in anything in life and right now um you know you got us right there in the middle and we're just kind of the rope and they're pulling us each way and you know I'm just hoping to get this thing to the end before it breaks yeah, I mean, I think everybody wants it over, and, and we'll see when that happens. What we do know to, as well as um, when you look at this on, on Monday night is whoever, whatever the direction is going in the SEC, Rob Lewis, everybody's still chasing the Crimson Tide. <laughs> and it's not close wow. right now. 
No. And, and you know, Ohio State had, had some key guys out tonight, but come on. Not not just not even close. I mean, if that's the if that's the second best team in college football, then my God, what a gap. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, you know, the the loss of Trey Sermon in that game was significant. But, Austin, it just, you know, we'll see what the next offensive coordinator can do at Alabama because Steve Sarkeesian – and, look, they've had weapons there in the past. I don't know if they've – I don't know if they've had a run of weapons like Judy Suggs, Devonta Smith, you know, and the wideouts that they've had. I don't, I, I don't know if, if Lane Kiffin or some others had that. But what Steve Sarkeesian has done with this offense – um, is is beyond impressive. Now, I got newsflash for Texas folks out there. He's not. He doesn't have this to work with when he gets there. So everybody in Texas who's going to be looking for for him to scheme up seventy yard touchdown plays at will, I'm not sure he's going to have the talent to do that. But he has taken talent and he is he has brought execution uh, to an extremely high level with the talent he has down. Well, there. here's what I know. The next guy, and it looks like it will be Bill O'Brien based off that's what they're telling recruits is really put behind the eight ball. Now, I won't say set up to fail, but you're set up to come back down to earth. You know, I mean, like, you know, they lose a bunch off this team. Not, you can't really kind of talk about, you know, everybody wants to talk about Devonte Smith. Man, I think the glue of that whole deal is, is Najee Harris because they use him out of the backfield. I mean, look at the championship game. Guys got over 150 all-purpose yards, and you know, you know, it just does it in a myriad of different ways. So, um, yeah, they're they're playmakers. They'll still have guys. I mean, it ain't like they're gonna be void of talent, but you know, they're naturally gonna fall back down to earth a little bit. You know, with you know, the loss of Sarkeesian, the loss of several of their key playmakers, and you know, a, a new offensive uh, coordinator. Yeah, I've just been impressed with what Sarkeesian has done for, for sure. All right, let's get back to Tennessee here. Um, pl- plenty of things to talk about beyond, uh, you know, the waiting game and, and seeing what happens here with this investigation. Um, Tennessee is trying to get ready to start a spring semester. Uh, Austin, nobody knew in the portal at this point. Uh, I, again, I think you see that as a positive. I, I was talking to it. Uh, this is an interesting note uh, as would to, to talk about the portal a little bit was talking to somebody in, in the SEC uh, over the weekend, and they said outside of about four, maybe five guys in the SEC who have gone into the portal, they're not sure that anybody else, even if they're allowed to, would, would transfer within the conference because they're not sure how many, confer- how many guys in the transfer portal in the SEC are coveted by other SEC teams. Um, yeah. which, which I thought was a pretty – I mean, obviously we know Gilbert is, Jamie Robinson – would be in that category for sure. Yeah, but he's went to Florida State. So, I mean, right. So he's already. And again, until he him. starts classes, everybody can still contact him. Tennessee can still contact Jamie Robinson, you know. Um, but once he starts classes, then, you know, persona non grata, you know, you, you can't be doing that anymore. So, you know, I, the, the one thing that I was told, you know, over the weekend was look for the SEC to actually adopt transfers within the conference because. It will only if you don't, and, and that notion that's been passed along you know, from people that I was told that you know in the conference is you know they don't want to strengthen. They would rather strengthen another conference team, but the kids bouncing around than strengthen another conference. Because let's face it, if kids can't leave Alabama and Georgia and go to other schools in this league, where are they? In, but they're from the South. Where are they likely going to go? Florida State, Clemson those other Southern ACC teams. And that's going to strengthen those teams even more. So I, I was told, look for that to actually pass in this or, conference. Go, go on the conference. West side, you know, Arkansas, Texas, you know, Texas, Texas, Texas a to Texas, Texas a to Oklahoma, Arkansas, yeah. Oklahoma, that kind of thing. Yeah, no doubt about that. I think what's interesting too is the New York Times article that came out over the weekend suggesting that they might table the vote on the one-time transfer. Uh, in addition to tabling the the name uh, image likeness uh, ruling as well, because there's still so many question marks uh, abound about that. Um, that would be a, a pretty significant twist in all of this, Rob Lewis, if um, these kids went into the portal with the uh, portal with the understanding or belief that they were going to be eligible wherever they go. Yet they they table that, and you don't know if you're going to be eligible wherever you've transferred to. 
Yeah, I mean that's. I mean, I think don't don't you think that just about everybody that's gone in has gone in with the assumption that you know it's that we're all good to go. I mean, I think that would be if if they table that that, that changes things for for a lot of kids. Yeah, and that would be an inter- an interesting discussion to to come out of that because a lot of kids were under the impression uh, and have been under the impression that they would be eligible immediately. One guy, Austin, that is eligible immediately is. Uh, Hendon Hooker, the quarterback transfer from Virginia Tech, has a grad transfer coming to Tennessee. Um, I didn't see that one happening coming down the pike. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure Tennessee saw it. <laughs> well, it did. Like, they knew they were in play, but, like, the kid wanted in right away. I, you go back, he liked Jay Graham, felt comfortable with Pruitt and Winky on the phone. And then, honestly, I think the distance from home and the be able to play in the SEC just mattered to him. He was not going to have to go too far. Tennessee or South Carolina, or, you know, I, I know that, you know, there's obviously questions here, but like, you know, if you're going to go to a program, who's got more talent right now? And I would say that's Tennessee offensively. Well, and at, the, and at the time he made his decision, South Carolina was without an offensive coordinator. Now they've since hired Marcus Satterfield. Uh, but when he made that decision, it was unclear who was going to be the, the offensive coordinator at South Carolina and watching some games of him, of, of his, I mean, there were moments, Rob, he was a solid quarterback and a good, pretty good player at Virginia tech. He didn't have a great year this year, but he had some moments where he was, where he wasn't bad at all. And is going to certainly give some competition to a room that needs some competition. Yeah, I agree. And I'm, you know, when you're, when you go into transfer season and, and you're looking to take a guy and, and you're not, you know, going to, grab the top tier dudes like the guy from Wisconsin with Notre Dame. I, I think it's a nice pickup. 89 quarterbacks in the transfer portal, which is pretty, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, but Tennessee gets a, a transfer. It's the, thing to do, Hubs. it's the it thing to do. It is. How You're, about JG to Washington state? That seemed, that seemed wildly random. I, 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 will you, will you stay up late at night next year and watch JT Shroud versus Pac-12, Pac-12 after dark? Um, we may get them in the morning, though. They may keep they may keep that. Keep, we may get keep, them for breakfast. Keep that nine a.m. kick out on the out on the west coast. Yeah, Rob, it was random, and, and I, I wonder, you know, how many Power Five options did he ultimately have, and did he just want to get away from the region? Did he want to get out of the South after, you know, playing here and being involved at Tennessee for four years? Did he did he want to get so far away and completely wipe the slate clean and get a fresh start that way? I don't know, uh, but I did not see Washington State. Look, JT Trout going to Colorado makes sense because he's from the West Coast. But Garantano to Washington State, I did not have that in the pool as, as potential landing destinations. That's for sure. No, we're talking about a change of scenery. Yeah. That's a uh, change that of weather, a, change of scenery. There's a whole lot different out there. Change, change of scrutiny, change of if pressure. If he had only been able to go to Washington, then he could have been the only potential quarterback to start games at the only two stadiums that you can get to by both by land and water. But it didn't happen. Such a Seinfeld useless knowledge reference there, but well done, Austin. But if Price. the game is at Washington next year, <laughs> he could be a rare person that's played in both Neyland Stadium and then there at Washington Stadium. Wow. Same thing. There you go. Same principle, right? Um, all right, so let's let's talk a little bit, Rob, a little bit of hoops here. Is this Tennessee basketball team um, supposed to play Vanderbilt twice uh, this week? Schedule's getting all murky. Got some, you know, COVID issues going on in the conference right now what, what do you make of this team two weeks into conference play and, and what do you think this schedule is going to look like moving forward i tell you, i in talking with some people I, I i find it tough to think that there's going to be an sec tournament now i don't maybe there's a workaround there but with all these games being missed i mean if i almost at this point think the only way you're going to have an sec tournament is if you throw the 18 game conference schedule out the window which you know they can do. I mean, the the baseline is you, you got to play thirteen games total to to be eligible for the NCAA. And I wonder if it's if we don't see the SEC cater to teams like Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama at the moment, teams that are that have nice NCAA resumes already, and make sure they get as many games in as possible. Because I mean, if you're if you're South Carolina right now and you're sitting there and you have played one league game, I mean, how are you going to play 17 games over the next, what, seven weeks, eight weeks? I don't, it's just, it's not seeming very likely to me if 
the SEC tournament remains in place. So I think that's something that the league is going to have to look hard at. Why, and why in terms we, of the Vanderbilt game, go ahead. The one obviously we we posted the one Tuesday is canceled. There's still a chance they could play on Saturday. Vanderbilt has another round of testing on Wednesday. If guys come back clean from that, then um they could still play on Saturday. And Vanderbilt's dealing with more contact tracing than anything else, right? Yes, contact tracing. All right, so you're you're saying potentially no SEC tournament. Well, that's just me now. Just you know, that's just okay. me speculating. Why why would why would the I, to counter that, I would say, you know, based on winning percentage or, or whatever, find a way to seed it, seed them. That way you got a chance to get somebody else in the tournament, the, yeah. the big tournament, if you could win. That's another way to look at it. I just, I guess it comes down to, are they going to eventually decide that there's no way they're getting 18 games in and they're not going to use that last week to, you know, play makeup games. If, if they decide that, you know, the 18 game schedule is impossible to get to, then yes, I, I, I think your idea is what happens. They'll use winning percentage to determine seeding and, you know, see if they can't, you know, get one more team in, get that check. You know, here's another question that I've wondered and um, what was talking to, to somebody about this. Would the NCAA be interested or would they look at moving the tournament start date back or trying to get conference tournaments eliminated. Now that would make it very difficult for smaller conferences for sure, just in order to create a two week bubble before you sent everybody to Indianapolis in, into what you're trying to create there, which is a bubble for a month in Indianapolis for the NCAA tournament. I don't think they would do that. And simply, I just think it's simply comes down to money. As somebody I was talking with on Monday night said that that's, that, that was their reasoning for, for, for keeping the tournaments in place would simply be money. All the TV revenue that you would lose. For, for the conference tournaments? Yes. Interesting to see. All right, let's, let's talk about on the court with this team. Viscovi gets that going the right way, um, and, and that's important for Tennessee. But I thought the biggest takeaway from Saturday's win over a and is they look like a team who was more dialed in on the defensive end. I don't want to say more committed because that's not fair, but they certainly seem more locked in on the defensive end I don't think a and is a good offensive team, but Tennessee's communication rotation seemed much better, uh, which they're going to have to have if they play Vanderbilt later this week because Vanderbilt shoots a bunch of threes, right? Yeah, and I mean, my biggest takeaway, I, mean, I, I thought that they, they did look like they were locked back in on defense, but I, I really like the focus that you saw, the way they started the game and the way they started the second half, and which is when you go on the road, those both of those, you know, the first four minutes are critical in both both halves and I thought you know they jumped out to a 14 point lead in the first half and then whittled that down to seven then bang Tennessee starts the second half on a 7-0 run to get it back to 14 and you know pretty much a never really threatened after that so that kind of focus and being dialed in early on both ends of the floor to the start the halves I thought was impressive that's what good teams do and 23 assists on 27 made baskets that was that was pretty big time to me yeah, you don't see that run of them. You don't see that happening every day. And, and Austin, you jump in here too as well. But Rob, for me, it looks like Jaden Springer is is emerging as Tennessee's best basketball player, most talented basketball player. What do you think, Rob? I mean, I, I mean, I certainly think he's in the conversation. But I, I mean, I think it's hard to say. I mean, Keon doesn't have the stats. I think he's the most talented guy they have on the team. He's not the most productive right now in terms of numbers. But in, um, Jaden, Jaden was really impressive to me as a facilitator on Saturday. It was six assists, and some of them were big time. I mean, really, you know, had a plan when he penetrated, knew where, knew where he wanted to go with the ball, set up guys for just – you know, he didn't have a lot of cheap assists where he, you know, kicked it out and somebody hit a 23-footer with a hand in the face. I mean, he set guys up for wide open buckets right at the rim several, several times. And, um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be tough for me to take him out of the starting lineup after the way he played on Saturday at Texas A&M. Did, did finish with a handful of turnovers, probably more than they than he would like, and more than Rick Barnes obviously would like. So he'll have to clean that up a little bit. I, and look, I, I'm not saying that Keon Johnson is is not really talented. Really, and I think Keon, by the end of the year, is going to be much better than where he is at this point. And I don't think he's bad at this point at all. I mean, you saw the the baseline drive with the layup to, to show you what all is in his in his arsenal and is available there. Um, so I, I think those two guys are going to continue to emerge and 
Um, I, I just – I was expecting Jaden Springer to be much more of a shooter, much more of a hunt his shot, looking shot first and what he's been. I, he's been much more complete than I thought he would be. I, I thought Keon would be complete. Springer's been much more complete to me, Austin. Rob, yeah. do you not agree? Do you not agree that his time at IMG playing around such ridiculously good players around him made him more of a pass first guy? I mean, he's more of a facilitator who can score yeah. than he is a scorer who can facilitate. Yeah, no doubt. And he was there for two years, not just one. And you know, kind of my preconceived notion about him was I saw him play a lot in the summer because I mean he was a Tennessee target from you know before his junior year, so I saw him play. You know. I don't know, eight, eight or nine times probably as, as an AAU player. And he was, you know, he had some other good players on the, on those teams. Drew Pember was on those teams, but Jaden was clearly the best player, you know, on, on out there. And he, in a, in summer ball, he's getting up, you know, 20 shots a game. I only saw him play it live at IMG the one time when they came to Catholic and he was much more the kind of player that we're seeing now. And as far as he and Keon, Jaden's just more polished than Keon. And I think it, most Anyone would agree. Keon ceiling ceiling is higher, higher. But right now, Jaden has a, has a lot more polish to his game. Do you think that's IMG related, though? No, no offense to where Keon Johnson played, but do you think that I, I think that that's he's more part. polished right now because of the competition he played night in and night out? I think a big part of it. Also, his dad played college basketball. You know, and I think Jaden's been, you know, quote unquote, coached at home right. from a pretty young age by, by a guy who who was you know a college basketball player. But yeah, I think playing at IMG is is a big deal. I mean, that's that's a top rate facility, and it, yeah. you know, and as AP mentioned, you're playing with, I mean, my God, last year, Brandon <laughs> Brandon Huntley Hatfield, who is a top ten five star player in in the, this year's junior class, was like the third guy off the bench for IMG. I mean, <laughs> it was pretty ridiculous. Well, so so it wasn't just play, who you were playing against, but it was also what you went against every day in practice. I mean, when you, when you went five on five and you went live in practice, you know, that's it was no a different rate. level, you know, it was a different that's level than what Keon Johnson was going against. At, at the bell buckle or at the web bell buckles. Yeah. No, no. And that's not a knock on those kids. That's just the reality of the difference of, of where it's at. Hey, I want you to explain this. I think you explained this in the chat. I've had a couple of people ask me the, the big man that transferred from West Virginia the timing was not right with that with Tennessee because of numbers, right? Is, yeah. is that why that never got real? Tennessee's full. I mean, and I just, you know, as much as you might be tempted to run a kid off mid, mid year, I mean, that's a terrible, terrible look, especially this year, you know, COVID year. I, I just, I just couldn't see Rick doing that. If he was coming to Tennessee, he would have had to come and, you know, pay his own way from that first semester or go home and, you know, sit on the couch until, until summer which I just don't think was very realistic. I think, you know, from talking to people, I think he had interest in Tennessee. He, he was interested in looking at the situation, but the numbers deal just made it kind of not feasible. All right. So EJ Anasiki, it looks like maybe coming back. Does that mean you have to play golf, Rob Lewis? Uh, apparently it does. Yes, is, it is, does. Is that right? Maybe I'm not going to dead horse though. You're gonna, you're gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to be a cheap date. Oh, listen, Rob, I can get us on some of the best in the Southeast. <laughs> And you're gonna, you're you're gonna, I, 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 we're gonna go and get you a box of top flights, and just let you hit those rocks down the fairway, slicing them into the rough, four putting, five putting. I want some Titleist Bolotas, AP. Yeah, they don't make Bolotas anymore, there, Rob. See, that's how long it's been since I played golf. <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't made Bolotas in twenty plus, twenty plus years. There, there, see, there you go. That's how long it's been since I played golf. There you go. But, but. It, it does sound like he is coming uh, back at this point. Now you're right, going to go along for this round of golf, and you're going to YouTube live it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Rick just kind of threw it out there today that EJ was coming back in his Monday Monday press conference and you know, acted like it was a done, a done deal. Now, obviously, you know, EJ could decide he doesn't want to do that. But, uh, yeah, Rick acted like it was, it, was, it was kind of written in stone. And I don't think that's a huge deal. I don't want to make more of it than it is, but – you know, it's a, it may not be a huge positive, but it's a positive. I mean, to have a guy back that can give you some serviceable minutes. Well, and you wonder what you wonder what kind of development he would have too if they have a normal summer. You know, he came in here and did not, you know, did not have a typical summer and, and normal development time with them. And obviously, this program is known for player development. So, how much can can he change, particularly on the offensive end of the floor? You know, with with, with another year of work with this offensive staff. Now, I'm not saying he's going to suddenly become a a scoring machine, but 
one would think that he's going to get quite a bit more, uh, you know, of a, of an offensive arsenal than, than what he's got right no, now. I would, I would definitely working with Garrett Mendenwald for another year. I would definitely think he will change his body a little bit. I think you'll see a quicker, more explosive player. Now he's not going to be Charles Barkley, but I, I, I think, I just think he'll, he'll be better from just based off what we've seen the track record with this, this staff. All right, let's go to some football recruiting right quick, Austin, as we get out the door here. Do Tennessee, to? Tennessee <laughs> continues. Yeah, we need to. We got lots of recruiting. Got lots of recruiting stories up on the site. Tennessee continues to work hard that in the state of Tennessee for 2022s. They're working in a transfer portal. We'll see what names emerge. Still looking for, um, I, I think, a, a rush in, um, a defensive back, if they can find one, maybe an offensive lineman. Uh, depends on if there's any more movement in Tennessee's transfer portal. I, it's interesting. Don't you think we're getting ready to get real tight against the window in terms of anybody else entering the portal with spring semesters getting started? I mean, Tennessee starts on the 20th. Yeah, but another start before then. So, like, again, if you're trying to go somewhere, why not go ahead and get gone and, right. and get there and get to your destination? So you're right. And, and I think that some of these kids, you know, are waiting to see what happens. I think some of them are, you know, skeptical to jump out there, not knowing the unknowns that are out there. Um, you know, again, I, I, you know, there some Tennessee's better players would have some real options. You know, I mean, like, you know, I think, you know, Quavar's Crouch, you know, if he got in the portal, North Carolina would be an option. You know, I mean, you know, I think, you know, a team like Alabama would make sense for Henry T if he got in the portal, Wanye, Oklahoma. But again, same thing I said on the board the other day, reporting on kids that aren't in the portal is to me just uh, fool's gold in a lot of ways because you can't, I mean, like kids change their minds. They get, they, they, they talk to their mom and dad and they change their mind. They talk to their coach and they change their mind. They just change their mind in general. You know, the, it, how many times hubs have you heard in the last three weeks of this, that, or whatever player going into the portal to go to this school and it didn't happen. Happens a lot. Sure. Yeah, I mean that's I mean, just that's part of the that's part of the next recruiting cycle. I mean it's yeah. the new wave of recruiting. It's how many times have we heard this kid's committed or he's privately committed and it never happens. You know, it, it's it's a very similar thing uh, with the transfer portal. All right, let's jump to the 2022s right quick. Um, we get a story up coming up a little bit later today on um, on Jordan James. Um, it, it clearly Tennessee is focusing pretty heavily on on the 2022s in state. Um, you know, they have questions, but they're all listening to Tennessee and all liking what they're hearing. Curious to see kind of where it moves at, what it looks like moving forward, right? Yeah, I mean, again, I said in the chat, like as of right now, like I've got, you know, I mean, I would put Ohio State as the leader for Dallin Hayden, you know. Um, they, they, that's, you know, again, because why? Because, you know, COVID happens. He's not been on Tennessee's campus. Now, he's never in a while. He's not been to Ohio State or Notre Dame, who are Tennessee's biggest two competitors for Dallin Hayden at all. But to when, you know, when Ohio State and Notre Dame started recruiting him, they started recruiting him around the gate as a running back, whereas Tennessee was telling him defensive back. Well, the kid goes for 2,000 yards this year. What do you go think he thinks he is? He's a, he thinks he's a running back. And, and, and honestly, having watched this film early in the year, I saw a lot of low angle stuff but the one I started watching the above you know the, the 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 coach's view I think he is a running back he's got a long stride and honestly if you go watch it he gets faster from the 30 yard line 40 yard line 50 yard line than he does the first 10 yards you know I mean like he, he really picks up pace and gets stronger over the course of the of, of long run so I think that's impressive for him I still think Tennessee's still gonna have a good shot there I'm just saying right now I would peg Ohio State as as, as the leader by a little um you know, Ty Simpson, I'm going to take a step back, going to see where things are. Sarkeesian's off to Texas. He's heard from LSU. He's heard from Texas A&M. Obviously, his dad's um, – one of his dad's players is uh, the um, son of Jimbo Fisher. So, there's a, there's a little tie there. I, I don't think Texas A&M is a real player here. I'm just saying, like, there's a relationship, so he's at least going to fill their phone calls. Um, he's going to fill Sarkeesian's call uh, from Texas. He, you know, he's still is talking to Clemson. But if Clemson doesn't wait on him, I think that he'll just, you know, he'll just move on or Clemson will just move on from him because I think that, you know, he's not going to do anything within the, the Clemson timeline, which is sometime this month. Yeah. So, but we'll see. I mean, I think the bottom line is right now, everybody just wants an answer. 
And when I mean everybody, when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Current players, recruits, fans, media, you know, um, assistant coaches. I think everybody around just wants an answer on what the direction is going to be. And the question is, when do we get that direction? Do we get that direction? And that's what all the focus is right now on Tennessee football. So we'll see what happens with that moving forward. That's going to do it for this edition of the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us on this Tuesday. Have a great day, everybody.